Stephen Pound. Mr Deputy Speaker, thank you very much indeed for calling me, sir, and allowing me the opportunity to uh, finally make my maiden speech. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I would like, as is the tradition of the House, to pay tribute um, to my predecessors, for like many members of this House newly arrived, I have not one but two predecessors, one of whom, Mr Greenway, represented most of what is now Ealing North. Mr Greenway was an extremely capable and active constituency MP who made a very considerable impression on us in Ealing North. He was a man who is extremely fond of this building and is in fact a frequent, almost daily, visitor <laughs> to it still. And the fact that he is ever greeted with a smile by old and new friends shows, I think, the extent of the amity which he engendered during his time at this house. We also in Ealing North were represented by the present Right Honourable Member for Hampshire North West, an extremely hard act to follow. The Right Honourable Member for Hampshire North West is a man who is still revered, would not be too strong a word, in parts of the constituency. I am, in fact, Mr Deputy Speaker, somewhat tired of constantly being told how I compare to the present Right Honourable Member for Hampshire North West. I'm told that he never, ever missed a single constituency engagement. And I swear that I will haunt the classes, church halls and clubs of Ealing North. But that does not satisfy them. <laughs> I'm constantly told that he presented cups and shields to every sporting group in Pittshanger. And I promise silverware by the truckload. Still, they are not happy. No matter how hard I try, as somebody said last week, well, you may do your best, Mr. Pound, but the present member for Hampshire Northwest was extremely tall. And you could always see him at functions. Now, I will take second place to no person. My respect for the present Right Honourable Member for Hampshire Northwest, and I admit before this House that he is extremely tall. <laughs> and that I am not. <laughs> I have to finally admit, sadly, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the present Right Honourable Member for Hampshire Northwest towers above me, both physically and, it must be said, in the affections of the people of Pittshanger. Before these two gentlemen mentioned, we were very fortunate to have Bill Malloy as our Member of Parliament yeah. in Ealing North. Bill, or as he now insists on being addressed, the Right Honourable Lord Malloy of Ealing and Greater London, <laughs> uh, to those of us who are his friends, <laughs> now sits in the other place. But he is still a resident in Greenford. He still misses not the opportunity to contact his local Member of Parliament on a, well, hourly basis. <laughs> um, and I am, of course, grateful for his constant <laughs> advice and encouragement. <laughs> The advice for me to resign and have a by-election to allow him to return <laughs> is not one that I have as yet responded to favourably. Bill Malloy was once described by no less a person, Mr Deputy Speaker, than Anthony Crossland as the best speaker in the House. And anyone who has spoken after Bill Malloy will know the truth of that. Yesterday at the Greenford Royal British Legion, I had the unfortunate task of following Bill Malloy, and it is not something I would wish on anyone. I also realise, Mr Deputy Speaker, that it is a convention of this House that one has to introduce one's constituency to honourable members. Here, sir, I am at something of a disadvantage because it must be admitted there is no such place as Ealing North. Um, when I say there's no such place, I don't mean that it's some uh, sort of northwest suburban brigadoon which only appears every few hundred years when the traffic jams at the Target roundabout <laughs> and the Hangar Lane geratory system are in cosmic alignment <laughs> and when the fumes on the A40 part to reveal a Shangri-La <laughs> on the Himalayan slopes that we Elonians call Orsenden Hill, but that Ealing North is in fact a mixture of hamlets, towns, villages, communities, bound together by many things, but most of all by the Boundary Commissioners. <laughs> but if we are a mosaic, we are a proud, and I'd say a glorious mosaic, and one of the things that makes Ealing North such a wonderful place to live in is the strength of those communities. Those communities cement that mosaic into place. 
We are, Mr Deputy Speaker, a multicultural constituency and we glory in it. We have a large Irish population, a large and growing Asian population. We also have the third largest Polish community in the world after Warsaw and Chicago comes Ealing. And this represents in many ways, if only in the number of Poles living in urban conurbations, uh, in many ways this represents the commitment made by the Polish people, the heroic degree of support that they gave us between 1939 and 45. Many of those Polish heroes were based at RAF Norfolk in the constituency of the Honourable Member for Rystip Northward. And we are as proud today in Ealing North of their contribution as the country was then. We have, it must be said, Mr Deputy Speaker, few really great buildings in Ealing North. Um, we have a number of buildings, few of them very great. We have the world headquarters of Glaxo Welcome, and that is a beacon, as the expression has it. We also have <laughs> the Warncliffe Viaduct, which was built in 1844, um, with considerable prescience by Sir Isambard Kingdom Brunel for the express purpose of linking Labour constituencies in West London, Reading, Swindon and Bristol, but unfortunately the Warncliffe Viaduct is a few metres south of the constituency. We have Ealing Abbey, a glorious building, but sadly also on the wrong side of the road. I have searched in the absence of great buildings and great places for, for great individuals, as I feel there must have been some of the great people who lived at some stage, somewhere, in Ealing North. I have searched, Mr Deputy Speaker. My staff have searched. My children have searched. And I have concluded that whereas we may not have great individuals in Ealing North, we have a great people in Ealing North, but a few names have emerged. Gainsborough's daughters were both of them were buried after death in <laughs> in Panwell. Sadly, <laughs> they were carried there from the constituency of my honourable friend Freeling Acton and Shepherds Bush. <laughs> Charlie Chaplin and his brother Sidney lived briefly in Hanwell. They didn't care much for it, but then at the earliest opportunity they returned to Bermondsey. There must have been someone, I thought, and then I found that Vincent van Gogh in the 1880s taught in a girls' school in Isleworth while conducting an alliance with a young lady in Rainer's Lane. <laughs> I thought to myself, Mr Deputy Speaker, as Vincent made his way from the constituency of my honourable friend for Feltham and Heston <laughs> to that constituency of my honourable friend for Harrow West, he would almost certainly <laughs> have felt the need to pause for refreshment on, of course, the return journey. And where better to pause for a revivifying drink on one's return from such an assignation than Greenford? My able researcher has examined police records <laughs> at Greenford Police Station throughout most of the end of the 19th century and, sadly, <laughs> it has to be pointed out that according to our own records there were any number of drunken bearded impressionists causing <laughs> mayhem in the pubs of Greenford in the 1880s many of whom Mr Deputy Speaker actually had missing parts of their bodily extremities <laughs> in the search was now getting somewhat desperate and Research indicated that there may be one way in which Ealing North stands unique amongst the 33 boroughs. In June 1889, a giant circus elephant <laughs> <laughs> collapsed on Castle Bar Hill <coughs> and died. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, the great pachyderm, with its last few breaths, <laughs> bravely staggered forwards and is in fact to this day to be found beneath the road, unfortunately, just over the constituency <laughs> border in Ealing, Acton and Shepherd's Bush. His last thought was to leave Ealing North, <laughs> I suspect. In fiction, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are similarly ill-served. 
One of the finest books ever written this century, Brown on Resolution by C.S. Forrester, a book that sent generations of us into the Royal Navy and regretted it immediately <laughs> afterwards, <laughs> features a young able seaman, Brown, who was the product of a brief liaison between a naval officer and a between-stairs maid, and they met on the Great Western Railway train at Warncliffe Viaduct. And one thing led to another, and they paused to pause in Ealing, and uh, before the copulatory instinct grew too strong <laughs> upon them, as they sped towards a hotel in central Ealing, where did they end up? I have to say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sadly, the hotel was in the constituency, my honourable friend, for Ealing, Acton and Shepherds Bush. The Nolan sisters, the Nolan sisters, attended Cardinal Wiseman High School. Sadly, <laughs> Cardinal Wiseman High School is about three metres outside the constituency <laughs> boundary. William Perkins, who discovered aniline dyes, may have lived in Greenford. He spent many a night conducting strange chemical experiments, and I have to say that's a habit which persists in part of the constituency <laughs> to this day, <laughs> without the success of Perkins. Mr. Deputy Speaker, other honourable members have been pleased, proud, and I have to say fortunate in being able to introduce the House to the league football clubs within their constituencies. We have none <laughs> in Ealing North. We have two senior clubs, Viking FC and Hanwell Town FC, who play in black and white, the same colours as, oddly enough, Fulham FC. Immediately to the south of the constituency, we have Brentford, just outside the constituency, but ably managed since last week by Mickey Adams, who was formerly the manager at Fulham <laughs> FC. <laughs> just to the east, we have Queen's Park Rangers, the club where Ray Wilkins learnt the craft that is now coming to flowering in his present job at Fulham <laughs> FC. Slightly to the east, we have, I'm afraid, Chelsea, um, where young Paul Brooker was on the staff, and he, of course, has now achieved his full skills and abilities at Fulham <laughs> FC, where he currently plays. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it would be wrong of me. It would be inappropriate, and it would be inexcusable for me, as the member for Ealing North, to constantly refer to a football club which is in the constituency of my honourable friend for Hammersmith and Fulham. And I will not do this. Under no circumstances will I seek to bring in references to Fulham into everything I say in this House <laughs> from now on. But it has to be said, Mr Deputy Speaker, that those of us born within sight of Craven Cottage may be described as having black and white blood. But we in Ealing North may not have been blessed with great people, great individuals, and great buildings. But the poet laureate, John Betjeman, did once pause a while in Ealing and dash off the odd verse. In fact, he said in 1961, describing parts of Ealing, he said, where smoothly flows the bicycle and softly flows the Brent, smoothly glides the bicycle and softly flows the Brent, and a gentle gale from Perivale sends up the hayfield scent. Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, may I warn members that if they visit Perivale today, <laughs> in anticipation of the hayfield scent, they may not have that olfactory experience, rather, indeed, the heady tang of diesel spillage <laughs> on the A40 is more likely to assail the senses. But we thank John Betjeman for his thoughts of Ely. And may I albeit by a most circuitous route, <laughs> arrive at the subject which we are actually debating on the floor of the House this afternoon. And can I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, as, as a London councillor, as a member for a London constituency, and as a Londoner born and bred, I have felt an extraordinary sense of, it has to be said, sir, for anger and frustration at the way in which London in the last 11 years has failed to achieve its potential. We have seen this dazzling kaleidoscope of quangos run our capital city. A kaleidoscope of quangos, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that does not delight the eye, but in fact benumbs the brain by their complexity and their inefficiency. Any London councillor who's had to deal with a minor traffic issue and found him or herself negotiating with the traffic for director for London, with the traffic control signals unit, will realize 
that the case can be made for a Greater London Authority on many grounds. The obvious ones, the grounds of democracy, the grounds of accountability, but most of all, Mr Deputy Speaker, on grounds of efficiency. The present system is no way to run a capital city, and any one of us who has any part in the governance of this city will know that. I look forward to, as a result of this, this evening's decision, London entering a new era in local governments. I look forward to our city regaining its rightful place on the world stage. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am so tired, as so many of us are, of the constant reference to what is achieved in Paris, what is achieved in New York, what is achieved in Barcelona, when I know that my city, our city, the city we are here, to, where we are tonight, can achieve all that and more if it only has that overarching strategic authority which can speak for London and with Londoners and is accountable to Londoners, then at last we can re-enter the world stage at the level we deserve. We are a mature enough city, we are a mature enough electorate to be allowed this democratic right. I, Mr Deputy Speaker, am endeavouring to be as uncontroversial as possible in this maiden speech. But I have to say, sir, I take no lessons from the party opposite when they speak of democracy in our capital city, when they have denied us that for 11 years. Yeah. And I think many of the comments I've heard tonight have been caviling, carping comments aimed more at the minutiae of this bill than the principle. And it is the principle, sir, which I wish to address tonight, the principle that London as a great city, as a capital city, must have a collective purpose and an identifiable leadership. We must have that, and no amount of opinion surveys can say different. And I'm delighted that tonight we take the first step back on the road to that city governance that we need. We're not going back, Mr Deputy Speaker, we're not going back to the GLC. When the GLC was abolished without, unless I have forgotten, any form of referenda or consultation or democratic accountability or discussion or consultation policy, but as I recall, I think by a paving bill. We're not going back to the GLC, even though we were told at the time of abolition that all Londoners would save vast amounts of money by the abolition of the GLC, that we would have a lean representative agency representing us. I don't see many of us swaggering around Greenford lighting cigars with £10 notes with all the money we've saved from the abolition of the GLC. Far from it, I see constant duplication, I see confusion, I see the inability for London councillors and MPs to manoeuvre between the rocks of these quangos in our city's interests. I don't think the abolition of the GLC was in London's interests. I didn't think it then and I know it wasn't so now. Mr Deputy Speaker, by agreeing tonight the referendum bill, we give Londoners the opportunity to vote on their strategic authority. We give them the chance. We don't say you will do this, you will do that, but we give them the opportunity. We show them the respect that Londoners deserve to have the chance once again to have the pride back in our capital city, our great city, our London. Mr Deputy Speaker, I thank you for your indulgence and recommend the bill to the House. Yeah. Yeah. Simon Hughes. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'll start